Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, would like to take this opportunity, opportunity to welcome you all to this webinar on alternative dispute resolution under the treaty establishing the East African community challenges and opportunities. My name is Edith Trinamesco. I'm a dual qualified advocate of the High Court of Kenya and Uganda, an associate member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. I'm also the founder of the Women in Arbitration Initiative, which seeks to encourage diversity in alternative dispute resolution. I'll be your moderator for today. First, I would like to thank the East African Law Society for organizing this capacity building session. So to dive right in, the East African community is an intergovernmental organization comprising seven member states. That is Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, South Sudan, Tanzania, Uganda, and the newest edition, the Democratic Republic of Congo. The, the treaty establishing the East African community was signed in 1999, and it seeks to provide a framework for regional integration and cooperation, including provisions for alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. However, the use of these mechanisms in the East African region remains low, and there are several challenges that hinder its effective utilization. So this webinar will explore the challenges and opportunities of the ADR in the East African region. The objectives of, um, of this webinar are to introduce the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration and the East African Law Society Partnership to the larger public. It will also highlight the provisions of the treaty establishing the East African community on ADR. It will identify the challenges facing the effective utilization of ADR in the East African region. It will share experiences and best practices on ADR in the East African region. And lastly, this session will discuss the opportunities for enhancing the use of ADR in the East African region. Allow me at this juncture to introduce our distinguished panelists. Our first speaker today, who we are all familiar with, is Mr. David Sigano. He's the Chief Executive Officer of East African Law Society. Welcome, Mr. Sigano. You can uh, unmute for recognition. Uh, thank you, Edith. Thank you. Um, our second speaker today is Mr. Lawrence Moyori Ngugi. He's the registrar and also the CEO of the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. He's also an arbitrator and accredited mediator. Previously served at the Chief State Council, Head of Commercial Litigation and Arbitration. He's also the member of Kenya's representatives to the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. He has handled high profile complex litigation, arbitration and international investor state disputes under the ICC the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law and ICSID roles. He's a holder of Bachelor in Economics and Law and the Master's in International Studies. He's also a certified public secretary and the research fellow of the East China University of Politics and Law. Welcome, Mr. Lawrence Muir. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Pleasure. Our third speaker is Dr. Kairuki Muigua. He's the managing partner of Kairuki Mugua and Company Advocates. He holds a PhD in philosophy. He's a distinguished law scholar, environmental consultant, an accredited mediator, and a chartered arbitrator. He has widespread training and experience in both international and national commercial arbitration and mediation. He served as the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Regional Trustee for Africa from 2019 to 2022. He has won several accolades, including the inaugural CIAB ADR Lifetime Achievement Award 2021, the ADR Practitioner of the Year Award 2021, the Af African Arbitrator of the Year 2022 Award. Chambers and Partners Global Guide 2023 has ranked Dr. Karaoke in band one of dispute resolution arbitrators, noting that he is highly recommended as a leading lawyer. He was also awarded by the Law Society of Kenya at the Law Society of Kenya Annual Awards for his outstanding mentorship and selfless support. He's also an advocate of the High Court of Kenya for 30 years. 
He has also been recently appointed as one of the members of the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague, Netherlands. Welcome, Dr. Karaoke. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure. Our fourth speaker is um, Her Worship Christine Mutimura Wekesa. She's the Deputy oh. Registrar of the African Court of Justice, and she's also a fellow, a fellow sorry, of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Welcome, Your Worship. Okay. Um, the last but not least, um, our fifth speaker is Miss Amina Okwanju. She's an experienced advocate and a certified arbitrator with over 10 years of experience in the field of legal practice and alternative dispute resolution. Ms. Okwanju is currently working as a legal advisor for MPEP, a subsidiary of a global integrated oil and gas company. She's also a panelist of the AFSA SADC panel of international commercial arbitrators and a member of the East African Law Society Women Lawyers Committee, In-House Council Committee and Alternative Dispute Resolution Committee. Welcome, Ms. Amina. Okay. As we wait for Ms. Amina to come on the call, we shall start with our first speakers. So our first speakers, uh, that is Mr. Sigano and Mr. Muiruri, will introduce the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration and the East African Law Society partnership to us. So this partnership will see members of the East African Law Society enjoy access to the use of the center's facilities to resolve the arbitration matters. But to expound more on that, allow me to invite Mr. Sigano Karibu. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Edith. You've uh, made my work a bit easier uh, by saying what our partnership with the center will do, uh, but probably we'll uh, add a bit of beef to what you've already said. Uh, first, let me recognize our panel. Uh, I worship the Deputy Registrar of the East African Court of Justice, uh, Ms. Christine Motimura, uh, multiple award-winning uh, ADR practitioner, Dr. Kariuki Muigwa, uh, the CEO and Registrar of the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, uh, Mr. Lawrence Ngugi, uh, our panelists, including Ms. Amina Ukwaju, uh, who serves in several of our committees, including the Women Lawyers Committee, uh, as well as uh, other committees, uh, our moderator for the day, Ms. Uh, Edith Twinamatsiko, who is also a founder of uh, the founder of the Women in Arbitration Initiative. Uh, I believe the initiative is in Uganda, but we can scale it up to uh, the entire East African region. Uh, ladies and gentlemen on the call, good afternoon. I'm pleased on behalf of uh, the Governing Council of uh, the East African Law Society to welcome you to this training. The training is uh, basically looking at uh, what we have at the regional level to support your ADR practice. What does the e, uh, ESC treaty uh, provide in terms of ADR practice in general uh, and specifically? Uh, what is the mandate of uh, the East African Court of Justice, for instance, when it comes to arbitration, negotiation, and other ADR mechanisms? Uh, and so this is a, a really important session for those of us already in the space of ADR practice and uh, for those looking to enter into this space. You will agree with me that uh, ADR is one of the fastest growing uh, legal practice areas. We are, most of us are moving away from uh, the normal litigation process into more uh, ADR focused uh, ways of resolving our disputes. We do not necessarily need to uh, be on the other side of a conflict. We can actually sit in a room and uh, come to a discussed or an agreed upon uh, solution for, for, for the benefit of the both of us. Uh, there's a story I like to tell, uh, and I think it's something that uh, might resonate with some of us. When I was in undergraduate, uh, I was undertaking my undergraduate studies, uh, a Kenyan court made yes, a decision. Um, there was a decision from a Kenyan court 
uh, where a criminal matter was resolved by way of arbitration, uh, by way of uh, an out of court settlement. Uh, so someone had committed uh, a murder, and then the families met, discussed, and decided, uh, well, we we can resolve this without having to use the formal court processes. And so a decision was uh, arrived at, and uh, I believe the court upheld that decision, a negotiation between the two families, and uh, the person was released. And that formed a basis of a dissertation I did myself. And I used a lot of your work, uh, Dr. Mwigwa, in writing that dissertation. Uh, so I, I thank you for really writing a lot uh, on ADR uh, practice in Kenya and potentially the region. And my argument, was, <laughs> my argument was, well, can we change our penal code and adopt our traditional justice systems to help resolve some of our criminal matters instead of having you know this huge backlog and having uh, so many people in our prisons can we go back to our traditional justice systems is, is it something that is viable up to date we've not done that unfortunately uh dr muigwa probably we can uh, still push this this discussion forward and uh have some form of adr in criminal matters because it's it's the space that is being left behind um, not to speak too much, let me introduce something on uh, our partnership with Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. Uh, we recently signed a memorandum of uh, understanding on MOU with the center. As you are aware, it's one of the largest uh, international arbitration centers in the region. Uh, a few more have arisen, but uh, the Nairobi Center still leads in terms of uh, the number of cases, and uh, even the size of uh, cases that come out of uh, it. And so when we, 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 we met with uh, the team from the center, we agreed that uh, there are a number of benefits that uh, members from the East Africa Law Society can get uh, by an MOU. And so we signed one, and uh, this MOU will potentially allow you to, one, and uh, CEO, you'll allow me to say this, uh, enter or be one of the people on the panel of uh, the center. I think there's a criteria for that uh, so that the center can then allocate you cases. Uh, and then the MOU will also allow us to jointly use each other's facilities. Uh, that means you can use our training facilities if you have uh, trainings in Arusha, you, we can use yours when we do in Nairobi, and similarly, you can use uh, our center for centers for hearing uh, matters whenever they arise. So, if you have a matter in Arusha, fortunately, we are next to the court, which provides free access to its own courtroom for arbitration. You can use the center, and when you are in Nairobi, uh, our agreement allows you to uh, to use the center. We also share. Uh, panels. Uh, Lawrence, you'll speak about this. Um, you'll also speak about institutional case admitted processes. Uh, we also promote and our partnership, the use of ADR in the region. So sessions like this are meant to show some of us that have not used uh, ADR that you can actually use it. And that's why we have speakers like Dr. Muigwa, we have speakers like her worship, the registrar, the deputy registrar of the East African Court of Justice, to show you what avenues are there to use ADR and the center itself to show you what avenues it has that you can utilize when uh, resolving your client's issues. Um, we also have recognition and accreditation reciprocal arrangements uh, between each other. So trainings under uh, NCIA are recognized by the ELS and ELS Institute and uh, the center promises to recognize some of our training activities and uh, we will do some of these uh, more accredited sessions where you're able to say join the panel we also support uh, each other's activities and engagements these uh, it may include informal activities like training sessions conferences uh, like i know the center has uh, uh, a conference that is coming up we've already shared that to, 
to our more than 30,000 members. And uh, we will continue collaborating uh, through other avenues to make ADR as close as possible to you as uh, a member of the East Africa Law Society. So that said, uh, I believe my colleague, uh, Lores Meruri will have much more to add on this partnership. Uh, and so I take it back to uh, Edith. Edith, back to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Segano. Um, allow me to invite Mr. Moiruri to shed more light on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Edith and my colleague, uh, David. Uh, good afternoon to all of you, uh, or uh, good whatever time frame you might be in. I'm not assuming everybody is within the region. As mentioned, um, I am pleased that this afternoon you could join us, um, Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, together with the East Africa Law Society. As my colleague has so ably introduced, uh, we recently, in the month of March, signed a Memorandum of Understanding, uh, which will act as a basis of framework for the two institutions to extend um, our various benefits uh, to the membership of uh, both the center and the society. So we do not take it for granted that you have made it time uh, this afternoon to join us in this webinar, which in itself is a product or a fruit of that MOU. So if I can pick it from where David has um, pointed out, um, let me just describe the center briefly. Nairobi Center for International Arbitration is an arbitral institution uh, located in Nairobi. Um, our jurisdiction, of course, uh, given the fact that we're international uh, center extends beyond the boundaries uh, of Nairobi, um, the region and the globe. Uh, we offer services, some of which have been highlighted by David, uh, including hearing facilities. We administer disputes, uh, arbitration, mediation. We will soon be moving to adjudication and other forms of dispute uh, resolution. In the course of that, we have become a bridge both to the supply and demand side of dispute resolution. Um, we regard your clients as part of the supply side and you as part of the uh, demand uh, side. And so we have become a focal point uh, when we talk about arbitration and mediation, international and domestic, uh, at least within the country and the region, alongside other of our colleague centers uh, in providing a platform for which you as practitioners uh, can access these services. I believe you set up your practice with the idea that it can be a source of livelihood um, and also uh, for the fact that you would wish to practice um, the legal profession. So in a sense, uh, if I could sum up the MOU, this is um, uh, an economic legal diplomacy. We do not only see dispute resolution as a means by which people in dispute resolve their disputes. When we consider the practitioner side of it, uh, we regard dispute resolution as a means of income generation. And not only income generation, if we think of it globally, it is also a net um, earner of um, export revenue. Many centers across the, uh, the globe, uh, which were more uh, popular in the past, that includes the ones in Europe and um, um, the other continents, America and Asia, um, have built an economic base for legal services uh, extending cross-border dispute resolution. And so there has been the challenge we have spoken about of repatriation of disputes from the continent, uh, disputes which concern contracts or agreements executed within the region, um, implemented within the region, and yet when they do arise, they are handled outside of the continent. And so one of the interventions to uh, stem the uh, repatriation of disputes outside of the continent and have them handled by practitioners um, on the continent, uh, uh, practitioners accessing these services on the continent is by the establishment of these uh, centers and the collaboration of these centers, uh, such as Nairobi Center for International Arbitration and the East Africa Law Society. And yet for us, we do understand also, it is not just uh, establishing the infrastructure or the framework, uh, but also giving the confidence to the user that we do have the capacity on the continent uh, to offer services that are equal to any globally. Where there are gaps, it is our intention uh, to develop that capacity through training, uh, a fact that David has alluded to, uh, specialized training, 
networking sessions, uh, bringing on the continent activities um, or events which expose the practitioner uh, to these practices that are being uh, held uh, globally. So we do believe with this um, understanding that we now have with the society, we will be able to extend our training facility to you. Uh, we will be able to engage you in uh, networking sessions, uh, conferences such as David has alluded to, the Nairobi Arbitration Week, which will be held uh, between the 18th and the 22nd of September this year. Uh, and so as we uh, grow your uh, contact with international dispute resolution, we believe then we equip you to access this uh, so-called um, export earnings from legal uh, services. We also then make available um, our infrastructure, including the rules, including our facilities in Nairobi. Uh, for you as, as practitioners, uh, we are going to explore uh, ways in which we can give concessionary rates uh, for the membership of the society in the use of these facilities, not only physical facilities, but also virtual facilities. Uh, we also um, invest uh, heavily on technology uh, infrastructure, which you can access uh, where, when you would want to uh, either use hybrid or virtual services uh, for dispute resolution, including our virtual hearing uh, protocol. Besides that, and I think which would be of interest to you, is accessing the panel. Uh, NCIA manages a panel of arbitrators and mediators. We do empanel practitioners. Uh, we have a criteria, uh, standards by which uh, we evaluate the empanelment of practitioners and would want to see as, as much as possible nationalities from the region uh, being uh, included in this panel. What are the advantages? One, exposure, uh, visibility. The moment you're on this panel, uh, when either we're exercising our residual power to appoint uh, or when parties themselves do inquire uh, for capacity within our panel, then you, you are visible and therefore uh, can access opportunities for appointment, uh, whether it's in arbitration mediation or even as we are growing towards adjudication and other means of dispute resolution. So we believe we have set the stage uh, for economic legal diplomacy uh, as we have entered into this agreement with the society uh, which will be of great benefit uh, to uh, you, our dear colleagues, as you continue to um, expand your scope of especially dispute resolution. Uh, the globe is growing towards the blue economy. Uh, we are now talking about uh, renewables. Um, a lot of these things are cross-border agreements. Uh, we would want to engage with the society uh, to build the capacity of practitioners right from the moment of negotiation especially the dispute resolution clauses, um, from the point of time of the practice itself, and of course, enhancing your visibility to the rest of the globe, uh, by which I do especially invite you who have joined today uh, to consider uh, saving the date for the 18th to 22nd of September this year to join us in Nairobi for the very first Nairobi Arbitration Week, which I also believe is a first on the continent where we will meet a network of practitioners from across uh, the globe. So in this way, we are already extending the benefits of this uh, memorandum of understanding. Um, open to questions later. Uh, so thank you very much, David, Edith, for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Mr. Mwiriri. Thank you for guiding us on this great partnership that will seek to benefit us all. Thank you for extending all the services to us, specialized training, networking events, use of your training facilities, among others. Just remind our participants to post your questions in the chat and we shall have a Q&A session after the presentation. So allow me to move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Amina Ukwajo, who will give a general overview of ADR in the East African region. Welcome, Ms. Amina. Thank you very much. Uh, so allow me to share my screen. So today we'll speak on the, excuse me, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> the topic today is ADR under the treaty establishing the East African community. 
challenges and opportunities. So my part will give a general overview of ADR within the EAC, referring the treaty establishing the East African community. So first and foremost, let's discuss what is alternative dispute resolution. So ADR simply refers to any method of resolving disputes without litigation outside the courtroom. All ADR methods have uh, common characteristics, and that is enabling the parties to find admissible solutions of their conflicts outside the traditional legal or court proceedings. Uh, they are governed by different rules, and they are more rapid, more affordable. Uh, confidentiality is mostly guaranteed, and they are very flexible. One of the primary reasons that party may refer to ADR proceedings is that unlike adversarial litigation, ADR procedures are more often collaborative and allow the parties to understand each other's position and come up with more creative solutions that may not be available through litigation. Uh, there are different kinds of alternative uh, resolution here because uh, we, as we can see, we are mostly uh, uh, conversant with arbitration, but we will discuss the methods that are commonly used within the East African community. So the first and foremost will be negotiation. Negotiation has also uh, been characterized as the preeminent mode of dispute resolution and is almost always the first method used to resolve a dispute. It allows the parties to voluntarily meet in order, in order to settle a dispute, and there is no third party involved who facilitates the resolution process or imposes a resolution. The main advantage of negotiation is that it allows parties themselves to control the process and the solution. And negotiation is more or less formal than other types of ADR, but allows for more flexibility and confidentiality because it takes place between the two parties to a dispute. And then another method, uh, there is mediation. Mediation is an informal alternative to litigation, uh, which consists of negotiation between disputing parties, assisted by an acceptable, impartial, and a neutral third party, who is known as a mediator. A mediator has no decision-making power and does not decide for the parties, but rather encourages or assists the disputing parties in voluntary, to, for, to voluntarily reach in their own a mutual, mutually acceptable settlement of issues in dispute. A mediator encourages parties to explore alternative possibilities or options in settling a dispute. It is more formal and relaxed process than that of arbitration. Confidentiality is an important ingredient in mediation because most of the times we see that communications uh, that take place in mediation are without prejudice and cannot be used as evident in a sub subsequent arbitration proceedings or court action. And then we have conciliation. Conciliation is also an alternative dispute resolution process whereby parties to a dispute use a conciliator who meets with the parties either both or separately in an attempt to resolve their differences. They do this by lowering tensions, improving communications, interpreting issues, encouraging parties to explore potential solutions, and assisting parties in finding a mutual acceptable outcome. Like in mediation proceedings, ultimate decisions to agree on the settlement remains with the parties. However, unlike a mediator, a conciliator will play an advisory role. A mediator can advise. We saw that, uh, sorry, a conciliator can advise. We, are, we have already discussed that a mediator can basically be neutral, cannot form, a, cannot form a position, but a conciliator can actually advise and intervene in order to offer a feasible solution to both parties and help them settle their disputes and may even provide a non-binding settlement proposal. We also have a collaborative law. Now, this usually involves attorneys who facilitate resolution process within the specifically contracted terms. The parties reach an agreement with the support of the attorneys. These people know law or know the subject matter of the conflict or mutually agreed experts. No one imposes a, re a resolution to the parties. And last but not least, now we will discuss on arbitration. Arbitration is one of the most embellished growing forms of alternative dispute resolution in East Africa. 
It is more formal alternative to litigation and has a lot of similarities with traditional court proceedings. Participation is lit, uh, typically voluntary and there is a third party who usually is a private judge imposing a resolution uh, or, an, uh, or an arbitral award and it's usually binding to the, to the parties. Arbitration often occurs because parties to contracts agree to any future dispute concerning the agreement will be resolved by arbitration. Oftentimes, uh, prior to the dispute occurring, parties usually enter into a binding arbitration agreement or any other form of agreement with an arbitration clause, which allows them to lay out major terms for the arbitration process. It could be the number of uh, arbitrators, it could be the arbitration forum, it could be the arbitration place and what so not. In practice, the parties combine the use of these different ADRs, for instance, the parties may stipulate in their contracts that in the event of dispute, they will first submit an attempt to amicable settlement, which could involve a conciliation to mediation. So we can see these different forms of, of ADR uh, being used uh, combinedly. And only in the event of failure, they will resort to arbitration. ADRs therefore come into play at different levels and have, complement, have a complementary character towards each other. In most cases, public courts may be asked to review uh, the validity of ADR methods, maybe in a contract or which parties have chosen, but rarely they will overturn ADR decisions or awards if the disputing parties formed a valid contract to abide by them. Now let's speak with, about ADR in the EAC referring the treaty establishing the East African community. I think we, we need to understand that one of the fundamental principles of the community that govern the achievement of the objectives of the community include peaceful settlement of disputes. This is provided for under Article 6 of the Treaty Establishing the East African Community. Historically, when the first EAC was uh, dissolved, the one that was formed in 1967, which dissolved in 1977, the member states, uh, that is Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, used alternative dispute resolution methods to negotiate and sign the East African Community Mediation Agreement in 1984 uh, that took place in Arusha, Tanzania, which involved the division of assets and liabilities of the former East African community and also agreed to explore areas of future cooperation to make concrete arrangements for such cooperation. We can see even the formation of the treaty itself involved negotiations between these member states, the current treaty that we have. It took three years for the parties to negotiate this treaty, which was signed in 1999 and entered into force in 2000. Now, Article 32 of the Treaty Establishing the East African Community makes a specific reference to arbitration, conferring the East African Court of Justice with jurisdiction to hear and determine any matter. That includes matter arising from an arbitration clause contained in a contract or agreement which confers such jurisdiction to the community or, or any of its institutions is a party, or any matter arising from a dispute between partner states or any matter arising from an arbitration clause contained in a commercial contract or agreement. Rule 29 of the East African Court of Justice Arbitration Rules of 2012 makes indirect reference to other forms of alternative dispute resolution, which leaves rooms to parties to a dispute to settle a dispute during arbitral proceedings, whereas a tribunal wants that dispute is settled they will terminate the proceedings. So it doesn't specifically say they can set up uh, this uh, this uh, through mediation or uh, negotiations, but it leaves room for that. Now I will uh, lightly speak on the advantage of arbitration in the East African community. We see that it's cost effective because uh, arbitration takes place uh, free in the EACG with no fees payable to arbitrators except for one of minimal fees when filing the, the claim. Uh, arbitrators are selected from judges of the court. So that's what makes it more cheaper. We see competence. Ad another advantage on the issue of competence within the East African community using the EACJ is that they, uh, that is that the arbitrators that 
in the tribunal are actual court judges that are very educated, they are high ranking and experienced uh, or legal practitioners across the East Africa partner states. Now, with their level of education and their level of internal training that takes place within the EACJ, it gives, uh, it makes them more competent to handle these matters. Thirdly, we see the party autonomy. Uh, arbitration within the EACJ embraces party autonomy in a way that they can select an arbitrator from the judges of the court. They can choose their applicable law. They can choose their place of arbitration. And lastly, it's impartiality because EACJ offers opportunities for parties to de-associate themselves from home buyers and have such disputes arbitrated by judges from different countries as the parties in the dispute. Also, judges are allowed to disclose if they have any uh, conflicting interests, interest, and also parties can challenge an arbitrator. You can, uh, you can ask uh, the court to remove an arbitrator if you're not confident in them. So that is all I have to say for today. Uh, I will see you in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very Moderator. much. Yes, thank you very much, Amina. Thank you for the comprehensive overview of EDR. Um, you summarized the EDR mechanisms and the advantages. So um, I'm going to call upon our next speaker. Just before, I want to remind our participants, kindly post your questions in the chat and we shall have a Q&A session after the presentation. So allow me to invite Dr. Karyuki. I know you've touched a bit on the overview of ADR uh, in the East African region, uh, but uh, Dr. Karyuki will add on that and also challenges and opportunities. Welcome, Dr. Karyuki. Good afternoon, everyone. I could easily say we go home now because uh, we have uh, covered everything, but not quite. I would like us to take a few minutes, and I've been given seven minutes, uh, to reflect on ADR and uh, the treaty establishing the East African community, challenges and opportunities. When I say we reflect, we begin with the very question, what is ADR? And are we defining it wrong? ADR is supposed to be alternative dispute resolution. But who said it is alternative? In Europe, ADR is alternative to the courts. So the definition is correct. But in Africa, we should be asking the question, is ADR alternative? Or have we mislabeled it? Is it really alternative in Africa? So I will post a set of questions that will allow you to reflect later on whether we've gotten it right. Because if we get it wrong from the word go, it means everything we say afterwards will be wrong. If we call it alternative and then apply it to Africa, we have a problem. Whenever a conflict occurs, the mechanisms, certain mechanisms kick off. In an African context, you will find that Africans used and I would like to live in harmony and peace, very close to what the Chinese and the Eastern uh, people advocate. So peace is a norm, harmony is the norm. Anything disrupting the norm is frowned upon. So within the African context, uh, the Africans are saying, this is the norm. So do not go away from the norm. And they're also saying, we are together. We are one community. You heard of the philosophy of uh, Ubuntu. I am because we are. So we must come from there and reflect on whether or not this thing we are discussing is actually alternative in the African context. And if we find that it is not alternative, then we give it the correct name. Some people will call it appropriate dispute resolution because it is the appropriate thing. So where do we find it uh, within the, uh, the context of uh, the East African Court of Justice? We backtrack and go back to the UN Charter. All the members of the East African community are members of the UN Charter. And what has been discussed uh, before uh, this, Pacific Settlement of Disputes, Article 33 of the UN Charter, is to the effect that whenever there's a dispute anywhere in the world, 
it shall be dealt with through negotiation, conciliation, mediation, arbitration, diplomacy. And uh, in the African context, and uh, indeed uh, within the African East African community, these mechanisms have been built in into their laws. I know about Uganda. I know about Article 159 of the Constitution of the Republic of Kenya, and also some laws within Tanzania. We have built in these ADR mechanisms. So these are the mechanisms we are talking about and asking the question, how do they fit in within the East African community, which is a, uh, which also has a court within, um, uh, as enshrined by section or article 23 of the treaty, where do they fit in? And that's the question we have before us this afternoon. We have heard that uh, the court has arbitral jurisdiction under Article 32. The East African Community Customs Union also has uh, references to ADR. It refers to conciliation and mediation and also arbitration within that context. But I think it will be important to ask ourselves what are these mechanisms? Are they all the same? I have had uh, in the past people saying that uh, something like arbitration is cost effective. It's not actually, and it's also a court process, but it can be cost effective. It can be flexible. It can be that mechanisms uh, that uh, the parties are looking for. It can be what the parties want it to be because of the principle of party autonomy. So it is a question of looking at these mechanisms and asking ourselves, how can they be used in a more efficacious manner than they are being used now? Talk about negotiation. Negotiation is not something new. It is something we do every day. How can it be incorporated in its most informal sense? And I'm thinking about uh, cross-border trade, for example. There's no formality there. And what is it that these people who trade across the borders do with negotiation as a tool? What about the cattle rustlers uh, across borders? What is it they can do with negotiation itself? So let's not think formal. Let's think informal. And this is uh, the East African community. So informally, what is it we can negotiate? between traders, between governments, between institutions. Already we've heard that uh, we've negotiated today uh, certain things, including an MOU. What is uh, mediation? Mediation, and this link is usually lost, flows from negotiation so that two parties who are negotiating reach a deadlock and they invite a third party to come and help them to continue negotiating. Mediation is uh, confidential, and sometimes uh, it is non-binding if parties do not agree. However, with the Singapore Convention, we must take mediation and commercial mediation very, very, very seriously because agreements arising across the borders through mediation can be registered in those countries. And uh, countries are already acceding to the Singapore Convention, so it becomes a tool globally for resolving of our conflicts across borders. Can we look at it? Can we apply it more within the context of uh, the East African community? Arbitration, you've already seen what, is, what it is. One advantage, the only advantage I know about arbitration, it's not even the cost. You should see the figures, they are bad. But arbitration is a bridge across jurisdictions. We have the New York Convention, and uh, it has signatories who are over 150. So if you have an award in one jurisdiction, it can be enforced across 150 jurisdictions. Then the model law is also acceptable. In Citro model law, Lawrence, you will tell us what that is later. It's acceptable across uh, over 150 jurisdictions. So it's a bridge across jurisdictions. and you can go to Uganda as a practitioner, Tanzania, Tahiti, Australia, and practice arbitration so long as you are instructed. You can also sit in uh, courts, international courts and tribunals across the whole world. So if I have a practice where I practice law 
uh, arbitration then allows me to practice beyond my jurisdiction, beyond my region uh, globally. There is conciliation, conciliation, and sometimes it's called reconciliation. Today, we shall not debate the difference, but you find it in labor disputes, and you also find it within the treaty framework. For example, the East African Community Customs uh, Union uh, settlement mechanisms, you will find reference to conciliation and mediation and something else called consultations. So you have uh, this word consultation and con consultation is really, you sit in a room and ask uh, yourselves, what is this? That is, what, what are the matters uh, uh, in front of us? You could also have good offices. You send somebody who is good in that area to inquire. And all these are mechanisms aimed at amicable solutions within the member states, within institutions that are within the member states, and they can be used here. So it's, a, it's wide. You can also combine, for example, arbitration and mediation so that uh, when parties agree in the course of an arbitration, they can come and record a consent. So there is that party autonomy, and I think it can be used uh, here. Adjudication is all over, across borders in construction disputes. You must realize that um, these mechanisms are divided largely into two. The ones that are coercive, very, very coercive, like arbitration and adjudication, there's an award against somebody. And the ones that are resolution mechanisms are non-coercive mechanisms, which are negotiation, mediation, conciliation, and so on. But there is also TDRMs, traditional dispute resolution mechanisms, like uh, the one that was referred to. Do they have a role within the East African community? Or do we just look down on them? And what formal law has done is to look down on them for ages and ages and ages. With colonization, and a lot of these countries were colonized, the traditional justice systems were watered down. Is it time that we look at, looked at them? and gotten the best out of them, and then imported it into the mainstream. How about diplomacy? I've had the word diplomacy a few times. It is a, a mixture of all that, negotiation, consultation, good offices, and so on. And it can be used to resolve some of the most complex uh, problems. Just sit down at a table and talk. Are there challenges? Yes, there are many. Have we built our framework? Maybe not really to the maximum effect and it's a, it's a job in progress, we should do that. Do we have a harmonized legal framework? Even that is not yet complete, it's a work in progress. What do the national courts think about the mechanisms that I've just cited? And again, there is a tendency to think about them as inferior to the written law. What about bias against African countries, basically and their systems? You will hear somebody saying, I had a friend of mine saying Africa is corrupt. And he throws that across, across the board, but it's a perception. What are we doing to change that perception? Is it true? Marketing, how often do we market these mechanisms? Have we realized that it's necessary to market even the court itself, the East African Court of Justice and the mechanisms. And why do we disregard the TDRMs that can work very well across uh, the borders with ordinary people? Things like language, what language do we use? If we are resolving problem, uh, disputes and conflict in an area where they don't speak English, why do we use English? Can we sensitize these people about the mechanisms that are available? Um, we already talked about uh, ICT. What is the role of ICT going forward? And have we used it uh, properly? Uh, in future, I see a lot of ICT so that people don't have to walk to these physical venues to deal with uh, problems. What about government support for these institutions that uh, support ADR itself? And I'm talking about all the governments. Is there a need to engage governments so that these mechanisms can be supported? 
How about the courts? Do we change their attitudes? How about looking at these mechanisms and making them perfect in a sense? Mechanisms that respect human rights, mechanisms that are modern and not uh, and um, very, very old. Okay? How do we support the informal justice systems? How do we get more women into this process? And you will notice that if you look at ADR uh, in that broad spectrum, women are not left out, but there's a lot of work to be done in the very formal ones, like mediation and adjudication. I know very few women in construction adjudication, for example. What is it we can do to bring everybody on board? So does ADR then have a future in this context? Yes, it does. Can it be useful within the East African uh, community? Yes, it can be useful. Are we doing well? Yes, we are doing well, but we can do much, much, much better. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kariuki. Of course, I'm seeing some questions in the chat, but uh, we shall take them after all the presentations. So allow me to go straight to our last uh, presenter of the day. Her Worship, Christine Mutimura Wikesa. You're welcome, Your Worship. Thank you, Edith, and good afternoon to you all. Um, I want to thank the organizers for organizing this very important um, webinar. So I'll go straight to the discussion, and I want to appreciate um, uh, Amina and Dr. Kariuki for the input they put so far, that is uh, in one way or another linked to uh, what my contribution should be during this webinar. So uh, briefly, uh, as we all know, the ESCJ is uh, the judicial body responsible for adjudicating disputes um, where jurisdiction is bestowed on the court. However, we have some special jurisdictions that are accorded to the court and this uh, um, hearing and determining any matter through arbitration pursuant to Article 32 of the treaty and Amina went into that uh, in detail. We can also settle matters through the ESCJ and next mediation process as provided for under Rule 64.2 of our ESCJ Rules of Procedure. So what are the rules that govern uh, the ADR process in, in the community? We have the arbitration rules of 2012, um, and these rules conform to international commercial arbitration practices, uh, therefore enabling our court to efficiently discharge its mandate as an arbitral tribunal. We also have uh, Rule 64.2 of the East African Court uh, of Justice Rules of Procedure, which governs uh, the court and next mediation process. And uh, this particular provision provides that mediation or any other form of settlement shall be conducted by the presiding judge who presides over a scheduling conference. And this will also be in accordance with uh, the guidelines set out in the fifth schedule. Um, in addition to that, um, sorry about that. Can I be heard clearly? Yes, 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 Your Worship. Can hear you very well. Okay, great. I just, I just needed to, to be sure of that. Thank you. All right, so uh, going forward, uh, how does uh, alternative dispute resolution support the aims and the objectives of the treaty creating the East African community? So as we all know, the objective of the community is to develop uh, programs and policies aimed at widening and deepening integration. And the ESC has uh, some of its fundamental and operational principles as provided in Article 6 and Article 7 of the treaty respectively, as peaceful coexistence, good governance, including adherence to the rule of law. And because of uh, alternative dispute resolution, uh, in the community, we have seen arbitration or because of the existence of ADR, uh, arbitration has been used to uh, settle peaceful, uh, peacefully settle disputes in the region, 
which is very key in cultivating uh, sustainable peace in the region. ADR has also facilitated the protection of the natural environment in the Republic of South Sudan. And this arises from the matter uh, Hope for Humanity versus um, Honorable Minister of Justice of RSS. I'll come into the, I'll get into the detail of this particular matter as we move on. Uh, and lastly, ADR has, has and continues to consolidate economic and social ties amongst the people of, uh, of the East African community, of course, through the peaceful resolution of, of uh, commercial disputes. So um, I'll go briefly on the issues that can be resolved through ADR at the ESCJ. We have uh, matters arising from an arbitration clause um, um, as contained in a contract or an agreement which confers jurisdiction to which the community or any of its institutions is a party. Uh, matters arising from a dispute between partner states uh, regarding our treaty. And that is if the dispute is submitted to it under special arrangement between the partner states concerned. We also have matters arising from an arbitration clause, which is contained in a commercial contract or agreement in which the parties have conferred the courts for its, uh, have conferred uh, jurisdiction on the court. And lastly, we have any matter that has been filed uh, before the ESCJ at the first instance uh, division and can be settled by mediation. Basically, we have, uh, we have, um, when a matter is filed before the court, uh, the parties are at the beginning uh, during the scheduling conference are given the option of settling the matter by mediation. And where they agree not to, then we proceed with the normal procedures of, uh, of a reference or a claim that has been filed before the court. And alternatively, those who agree to uh, the court's uh, mediation process, then they are subjected to that process. So I want to go into the details of the process of, um, of um, arbitration in the court, as well as uh, the court annexed mediation process. And I will start with the arbitration, the arbitration procedure before the court. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is governed uh, by our court rules of 2012. And a party wishing to submit a dispute to the court for arbitration must first notify the other party and then file a formal request for arbitration to the court's registrar. The request is in the form of a statement of claim, which ideally indicates the description of the parties, the nature and the circumstances of the dispute and the relief sought. Uh, the copies of the agreement containing the arbitration clause or an arbitration agreement must also be attached to the request as it informs the basis for invoking the court's jurisdiction. And once the request is duly filed with the court registrar, then the applicant is required to serve the claim upon the respondent, who shall then be required to file a response and a counterclaim within 30 days. The president of the court um, is the one who appoints the panel among the sitting judges of the court uh, to constitute the arbitral tribunal. And uh, Amina went into the details of uh, parties having the option of choosing who sits on the, who, who the arbitrators are, where the seat of the court is. So I will not go into those details. Um, moving on to mediation. Uh, this is governed by rule 64.2 of uh, the ESCJ court rules of procedure of 2019 and um, uh, the fifth schedule therein. So a court, uh, the court shall upon the close of pleadings and during a scheduling conference, invite the parties to settle the matter through mediation. And um, at least seven days before the session, every party shall prepare a statement and provide a copy thereof to every other party and the mediator. The statement should identify the factual and legal issues in dispute and briefly set out the position and interest of the party making the statement. The statement should be accompanied by a document that the party considered or considers to be of central importance to the action. Parties may attend the session individually or with their advocate. And on this note, I would also like to say that um, the court also um, holds uh, its session 
online so you can appear online and not necessarily physically uh before the, uh, the um, before the court or before the mediator or before the arbitral tribunal um a confidentiality agreement shall be signed by all parties and uh, the bit on confidentiality um this applies both to in terms of confidentiality both um the arbitral tribunal as well as um as um as the mediation uh, process is also subjected to uh, rules of confidentiality and parties shall sign a mediation agreement once issues in the dispute have been resolved and uh, where a mediation leads to a partial settlement an order will be drawn accordingly while the unresolved matters shall go to trial uh, at the escj a uh, mediation order is as good uh, as a court decree and uh, i didn't mention about the word the award the arbitral award being final um so how does adr differ from conventional litigation uh, in the escj in terms of duration expense and uh, formalities uh looking at duration mediation um according to our rules should be completed within 21 days after commencement however an extension of 15 days may be granted after good reason has been given um from our previous experience with mediation um the mediation that was uh, conducted here did not did not even you know it, it did not meet the 21 days it took um, a lesser uh, duration um an arbitration matter before the escj will usually take an average of 12 months to be settled however this could be less based on the vigilance of the, of the parties but also the, the the tribunal has a role to play in terms of how fast a matter can be settled so looking at the expenses uh arbitration at the escj is at no cost with the fees pay uh we and we don't have any fees that are payable to uh, arbitrators however uh a one-off filing fee is payable to the court when filing um, an arbitration matter and this filing fee is dependent on the amount in issue however arbitration we have found is still cheaper in the escj compared to um, other forums out of the east african court of justice uh, mediation on the other hand um, is a lot cheaper because it cuts down on travel expenses on parties and witnesses it also cuts down um, expenses on drawing and filing of pleadings at the court in this case each party bears the costs of the matter unlike where one party wins and the other is condemned to pay the costs looking at the proceedings or formalities mediation is an informal process of course so parties will be heard in the boardroom the proceedings as i mentioned earlier are confidential unlike in open court and the dress code for both uh, mediation and, and arbitration is um, informal so what is or what are the requirements that need to be met for one to be um, an adr facilitator or mediator of the east african court of justice so in this in the case of arbitration uh, one must be a sitting judge of the appellate division of the court and um, the judge president is charged with appointing a judge who will serve as an arbitrator needless to mention that uh, the arbitrator should have the necessary skills competence as well as uh, experience to adjudicate on the dispute in the case of a mediator one must be a judge who presides over scheduling conference and in that case it's the principal judge as per rule 642 of our court's rules and in the absence of the principal judge it is only the deputy principal judge um, who is charged with deputizing uh, the principal judge and i'll talk about the limitations of that when we get to the challenges um, of this process so how um how are these um see yeah we've talked about the appointment authorities uh however i would also like to mention that uh, parties are at liberty to agree on a sole arbitrator um 
whom uh, the court's president shall appoint by agreement of the parties. And uh, this also gives the parties autonomy to identify and select uh, a court judge with the necessary skill, competence, and um, experience required to adjudicate the matter. Um, the other one is um, whether uh, the decisions of the arbitral tribunal uh, have legal force or effect inside the ESC member states. And um, as the treaty and, and our rules provide, the award is enforceable through uh, the ordinary enforcement procedures of uh, a particular state in the ESC, in which um, the, that particular award is sought to be enforced. So does the court, has the court had any successful um, illustrative ADR cases involving um, the partner states? So in the case of mediation, so far we've had one matter. And uh, this is a matter where um, the government of South Sudan was challenged. Um, uh, it was a matter concerning oil spillage in the unity states uh, in South Sudan. Uh, and these were, this was a leakage of oil pipelines resulting uh, in environmental pollution that affected the population in this state. And during the mediation, the respondent um, who was uh, the Minister of Justice of the Republic of South Sudan acknowledged that indeed there was an oil spillage which might have led to an environmental hazard. The respondents also agreed to invite uh, an internationally recognized body to undertake an environmental audit and submit a final report. So the audit report confirmed the oil spillage and the government of South Sudan undertook to commence implementation of the audit report within 12 months. One million uh, US dollars uh, for the applicants lawyers was accordingly paid. However, uh, there have been reported challenges on the implementation of the agreement. And as such, uh, we have a matter that has been, or a reference that has been filed under Article 38, challenging the failure of the, of, um, the government of, of the Republic of South Sudan uh, for their failure to implement the mediation agreement. As for arbitration, we have three matters so far that have been concluded and uh, awards have been accordingly made. So does the court have any strategies or efforts in place to advance and improve the use of ADR in the court? Yes, indeed we have. We've had a number of training, uh, trainings and uh, we continue to organize uh, capacity building programs on ADR for our staff and judges. We are particularly grateful to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, um, the Kenya branch for their efforts in ensuring that our judges attain the highest certification in arbitration, as well as mediation. So at the moment, uh, 10 of our judges are at different stages of certification. And really our aim is to have all our judges, at least by the end of this year, attain um, uh, the fellowship. Um, so what, or what has the court done to guarantee transparency uh, justice and impartiality in our ADR proceedings. So the judges of the appellate division of the court, first of all, are persons of proven integrity from the partner states, judiciaries. And this has in many ways uh, helped us guarantee transparency uh, and impartiality in our proceedings. Uh, with the judges of the court being from different partner states, then um, impartiality and neutrality is key. And as such, uh, this has enabled us to minimize any possibility of arbitrator biases. Our arbitration rules provide that an arbitrator may be challenged on the grounds that circumstances exist that give rise to justifiable doubts as, the arbitrator's as to the arbitrator's impartiality and independence. And this can be found in rule 17 of, of our rules. And I think this is really progressive and uh, worth uh, commending. So what are the challenges that the court faces uh, with regard to ADR in the ESC uh, context? Uh, one of our biggest challenges is the lack of visibility of the court, it, which is something that we are really trying to grapple with. And this is visibility of the court by the business community and legal, and legal 
practitioners. And the effect of this is that there's a lack of awareness of what the existing ADR mechanisms are. I mean, our court has been in existence for over 20 years now, but still I could say a very large proportion of um, uh, legal practitioners are aware that we have these ADR mechanisms in place. We have also seen that in most cases, the respondent is the partner state and represented by, by the attorney general, uh, by the attorney general. So we have, for example, when a matter has been filed at the EACJ and we are having a scheduling conference and we ask the parties if they are willing to proceed with mediation. And we have found that um, uh, councils from uh, the AGIS chambers are usually very hesitant to, to submit to this process because the instructions that have been given to them are proceed with litigation only. So I also think there's an aspect of awareness that also affects this because um, I believe uh, this, uh, the, the AG's office should be aware of these alternatives and given the advantages or the benefits of settling out of court, then I think this would be a, a, a better option for, for partner states. So I think this is also another issue of whether they are aware that this mechanism actually exists and whether it can be uh, utilized by the partner states. In addition to that, uh, our rules limit who can be a mediator. And as I mentioned earlier, rule 64.2 states, states that it shall be a judge who presides over a scheduling conference who shall be a mediator. And in that case, it's the principal judge or the deputy principal judge. And in the event that none of them is available, then that means that matter cannot be attended to. So that is one of the, the main challenges. And the other challenge that the court has, um, as you're all aware, our judges are not permanent. They are here on a temporary basis and their sessions will be held based on the availability of funds. So we find that partner states, some partner states have um, consistently delayed uh, dispersing their contributions, which also affects our ability to hold our sessions as is required. So how does our court ensure our compliance with ADR decisions or settlements reached within the community? So the court's mandate um, ends at the settlement of the disputes and as such, there's no mechanism in place for us to ensure the compliance and enforcement of our decisions. And lastly, talking about diversity and inclusivity in ADR, I'd like to say that uh, in the case of mediation, of course, this, um, in the first instance division, we have only male judges. So in terms of diversity and inclusivity, I don't think we are doing very well there, but in the appellate division, definitely that has been taken, um, that has been given due regard. But we've also raised issues with, uh, with the partner states about the appointment of judges because we have not had many female judges being appointed to the East African Court of Justice. And uh, we are pushing to have more female judges appointed, especially in the first instance division. So with that, I wish to thank all of you for your kind attention. And um, yeah, I look forward to responding to the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Worship. Thank you for the for sharing jurisprudence uh, from the perspective of East African Court of Justice. So we'll go straight into the Q&A session. Um, okay. So I'm seeing comments, appreciating our presenters. Thank you. Thank you for logging in. Okay. Um, okay, I have a question. I think this is to Miss Amina. Um, how do you react as to why the state parties to East African community, together with their national, they do not prefer ADR mechanisms, especially arbitration, compared to other institution arbitration? I mean, I don't know if you can see this question and you kindly respond. Oh, 
or Dr. Karaoke? Actually, I cannot see the question. Okay, sorry. So someone is asking, um, I think it's uh, pertaining to state parties uh, preferring arbitration under their national rules or to the East African, under East African rules, yeah? Um, yeah, it's not well stated, but from the summary of it, that's what I got. You so can just comment on that. If we, uh, could you unmute the person so they can ask the question? Okay. Gabriel, I need your help here. Uh, the person is Stanley. Kolo Kola. Okay, we can just move on. Uh, someone is asking, what's the procedure to lodge a case from scratch to Nairobi from anywhere in the East African region? How strong should the case be? Costs and all that. Are we good? Doctor, you can take this one. What's the procedure to lodge a case from scratch to Nairobi from anywhere in the East African region? How strong should the case be, the costs? Yeah, that's the question. Doctor, you're muted. I am saying the registrar can take that one. It's a, a procedural question. Mr. Mwiri or... Um... I am thank... Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali, and um, thank you, Edith, for the question. Um, just to give a brief um, view of what it takes to file a case, um, the eulogia request under the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration Rules, uh, the presumption here is that the rules are already adapted in the agreement, uh, subject of the dispute. If not in the rules, this can be done by a subsequent um, adoption of an addendum to the agreement which subjects disputes or that particular dispute to the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration Rules. So the jurisdiction for us to entertain any dispute, whether for arbitration or mediation, is the fact that there will be an underlying agreement of the parties, whether they are two or multiple, to refer their disputes when they do arise or after they have arisen uh, to arbitration or mediation under our rules. Once there's such an agreement, uh, the um, either party can lodge a request under the rules, uh, that's rule five. Uh, once a request is lodged, uh, we will do uh, a check uh, to confirm that it complies with the requirements of the rules. Um, and then, we once we confirm that these are complete, the requisite fees in the case of domestic arbitration being 10,000 shillings, Kenya shillings, in the case of an international arbitration being 100 uh, USD, which as you can tell is minimal, uh, then we will um, inform the responding party um, of the, the, the filing of the uh, request. Uh, register it, and then, of course, we start the process of constituting the tribunal. Once the tribunal is constituted, of course, there will be the process of exchange of documents. Uh, there will come a time when the matter is placed for uh, hearing, that's evidence taken. Uh, once the evidence is taken, uh, the, a typical arbitration will then perhaps uh, end up in submissions. Once the submissions are done, uh, the tribunal then retires to uh, render its arbitral award. In terms of um, costs, uh, obviously, um, it will depend a lot, especially for uh, domestic cases, which um, the, the rate of fee for arbitrator is an hourly rate uh, ranging from uh, anywhere between 10,000 Kenya shillings to 25,000, depending on uh, the qualification level of the arbitrator. And this is agreed away from the moment of registration of the request. Uh, for international arbitration, there is a fixed rate at Valorem, um, which is pegged on the schedule uh, of the arbitration uh, rules. Um, I think to the last question, uh, how strong ought a, a case to be? Um, I think that is entirely left to the parties um, it, to seek legal advice or uh, 
advice of their um, legal counsel um, as to the merits or otherwise of a case before they, they lodge the request. Um, the strength or otherwise of a case uh, will not be a, a ground when we are determining whether to register or not. Um, the, the, the primary consideration, the prima facie test is whether or not there exists an agreement uh, which uh, allows for the parties to refer a particular dispute to the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration uh, rules. Thank you so much, I Mr. Mwiri. With your permission, okay. on, uh, yes, please. lodging an arbitration with the East African Court of Justice, first there must be an arbitration clause somewhere in a commercial contract or in a contract between the states or uh, the community itself or its um, institutions. That contract is what gives the court jurisdiction. How is it done? Uh, well, basically the same way you give uh, the necessary notices, but with one main difference that at the case management meeting, because it then proceeds as an arbitrator, then uh, the parties determine the timelines within which uh, pleadings are to be exchanged and filed and uh, also the place and mode of hearing and so on. So it proceeds like a normal arbitration from a certain point in time, but it all begins with a, a notification that that is the direction you're going. And the court would have no jurisdiction to go arbitration way without that, that clause in a contract. And this is uh, all to be found in Article 32 two of the treaty, 32 A and C. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Karioke. Um, Shafiq, I hope your question has been answered. Uh, let's move on to Brian's question. Is the myth uh, true among certain CEOs that arbitration can now not be considered cost-effective, given that the award is subject to appeal at the High Court and further appeal at the Court of Appeal? and his preference, preference to litigation by CEOs. Doctor, I think you can also take this one. I did say in my presentation that uh, arbitration is, first of all, is uh, coercive, and it's not cheap at all if you look at the rates. But I did qualify my answer by saying it can be cost-effective, it can be flexible, it can be expeditious if the party choose to go that way. And it is true that uh, as a coercive mechanism that is tied up to the court system, it can go all the way to the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court. I know arbitrations that have done 10 years, but parties can choose to have an arbitration getting finished within a month or two. And I've seen many of those in the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration and also uh, when parties choose to, to move forward. We can also have documents only arbitration. So it can be all those things. If the parties are willing to go that way, the principle of uh, party autonomy. Yeah, thank you. And I did say, sorry, I just repeat myself. It is that thing that is a bridge across jurisdictions. You will not go to a Kenyan court when you are suing somebody, Mozambique or some other place, some other island when there's an arbitration clause, because you need a, an award that is enforceable under the New York Convention across 150 countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. We have another question. Okay, I've seen a number of you asking for the presentation slides. They'll be shared after the close of the webinar. Thank you. So we have another question here. What will happen in a situation where one of the parties to a dispute is a state and hesitant to submit to institutional arbitration on the ground of sovereignty. Uh, you can take this or how ship can take this. Thank you. In arbitration, you can't be forced to go there. There has to be an arbitration clause that confers jurisdiction on that particular court. If it's not there, then you go to the court and proceed accordingly. That is in regard to the East African community that we are discussing. Thank you, Doctor. Um, well, we have one of your former students here, um, appraising your presentation. And uh, okay, okay. Um, Thank you, former students. <laughs> and you know where to get my slides, don't you? 
my work is uh, open uh, access to everybody. Books, slides, uh, just type my name, you get my work. Thank mm. you. We have a comment here from Kibet. Uh, Dr. Karyuki has opened up salient questions that were quite likely to be ignored. That was nice. Uh, we are sorry that uh, some of our presenters were not uh, heard, but we shall share the presentations after this. Um, okay, this question is to Mr. Sigano and uh, Mr. Ngugi. How does the partnership uh, between the Nairobi Center of International Arbitration and the uh, East African Law Society members. How does that partnership get uh, someone listed as a panelist? Yeah, someone is saying they once inquired from Nairobi Center from international for international arbitration only to be sent some cumbersome requirements. Yeah, so has this partnership eased the possibility of enrollment into? Uh, the panel membership. Over to you, to Mr. Muiruri and uh, Mr. Sigano. Okay. Um, the, 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 the fact that it brings both institutions on the conversation table uh, provides an avenue for us to explore ways where we can uh, meet the balance uh, between uh, practice and experience and the need to provide um, a level of assurance that um, anyone on the panel is um, qualified, uh, competent and capable of handling um, an arbitration, uh, mediation or uh, such like um, process. Now, because we need to devise a mechanism that is um, acceptable, uh, gives a reliable level of assurance, um, and of course, supported by um, a, a code of ethics and conduct, um, we have presently a minimum uh, requirement. And of course, we, we will be in conversation not just with the society, uh, but with other institutions, especially that do um, accreditation, uh, that uh, do training, uh, so that if it is, it is gaps of, of uh, of, of experience and capacity, uh, we can be able to attend to that. Uh, if it is about relaxing uh, the, the the requirements to the level that we can still um, maintain the confidence of the panelists on the panel, just like we do, um, even with our other professions, uh, there will be certain uh, uh, irreducible minimums, uh, but at the same time, uh, where there can be cross recognition where there can be a reduction in the level of accreditation between institutions. Those are things that can already be uh, discussed so that we at least alleviate whatever uh, hurdles that there might be in registration. However, uh, that said, I think even the profession itself uh, will appreciate uh, where there is a certain level of um, minimums which are acceptable as being that which allows for um, a level of assurance uh, to the supply side, the parties. Uh, we will introduce uh, very shortly uh, a category which allows uh, one to be on a panel, um, access mentorship, and upon attainment of a level of uh, mentorship, uh, then they can be inducted into uh, the, 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 the panel proper so that they can then uh, conduct arbitration. So that need of balance, I believe we, we will be now in a position to discuss with the society to allow you to be empaneled. Thank you so much. I think you can also take this one. Do we have institutions training conciliators? So um, if I can answer on behalf of the center, which I'm more familiar with, we currently are conducting training for arbitration and mediation. Uh, our next uh, point of call is adjudication. And of course, as we continue down the line, especially with labor disputes, where uh, we will uh, normally find conciliation, and not to say it is close to other uh, sectors, uh, we will address what level of training, uh, what kind of training, uh, what we desire is to have um, a high level of curricula, uh, which attends to each of every one of these uh, mechanisms where it is necessary to train. Of course, there will be some where uh, appreciably because of their nature, um, the kind of training that is to be rendered may not be 
in the strict sense, the kind of training we find in academics, if it is practice and experience, uh, we are heading towards that direction uh, to capacitate those in those fields uh, to offer training. There could be uh, institutions out there. Um, I am not aware of any within the region, but I'm very sure perhaps even within the region, there's somebody doing conciliation at the moment. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this question goes to Hawaship. Does that mean that submitting to ADR in the ESCJ automatically means submitting that the matter will be handled by a sitting judge in the case of arbitration and in the case of mediation by the principal judge? Isn't this a deviation from the principles of ADR? Your worship. Okay. Um, um, doctor, I don't know if you can take this question. Your worship, how worship doesn't seem to be online. I missed part of it. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. The question is, does that mean that submitting to ADR in the East African Court of Justice automatically means submitting that the matter will be handled by a sitting judge in the case of arbitration and in the case of mediation by the principal judge? Isn't this a deviation from the principles of ADR? I saw that and there are conversations around whether uh, the sitting judge, if he does hear the arbitration, he can continue with the same matter in another form. If, for example, a judge hears a, or conducts a mediation, can they go on with the arbitration? And there are principles there that uh, will say maybe he cannot move forward. But if you have an arbitration panel, they go up to the end with that matter. So there is really no conflict there. But there are discussions about how to expand the arbitrators, the number of arbitrators by that court. And there have been suggestions that those arbitrators could actually come from outside of the court. It's a, but those are suggestions and discussions going forward. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Doctor. We have another question addressed to Hawaship. Do we have an indication of the exact number of arbitration disputes already arbitrated at the East African Court of Justice? Okay. Um, I don't know if any of any of our panelists has an answer to this apart from her worship, but we shall get back to it when she comes back online. Uh, we have a question for uh, Dr. Karaoke. How can traditional customary practices be integrated into international law, given that international law as is con con contextually a product of customary Western law? There's a lot of English there. If you could repeat the first part, please. Okay. How can traditional customary practices be integrated into international law? Why not? If you have uh, two tribes across a border, and this is the way they've always done things, we should recognize that. Uh, and there are many, many conventions that uh, recognize that. Colonization, of course, messed up a little bit, but there are conversations from the South against the North, where we are saying our conflict management mechanisms should be in incorporated and integrated into the whole. And in fact, in national constitutions, you find a lot of that. In the Kenyan constitution, uh, for example, TDRM, traditional dispute resolution mechanisms, are recognized. And in a lot of countries, this is it. We recognize the reality on the ground and then try and uh, synchronize it with the international. And sometimes they don't always match. But I think if we are to move forward uh, seamlessly, we have to ask the lo local people how did you resolve your conflicts? How do you resolve them? Instead of assuming that the former is what must override the informal. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Another question for you. Is confidentiality in arbitration assured or has come? Who does it bind in the arbitral setting? Well, it depends on where. Uh, Confidentiality has been touted as, as one of the advantages of uh, arbitration, but practically across the years, you will find that uh, to the extent that an award can be challenged, uh, then confidentiality is not one of the very strong points because we get to know when the award is filed in court and it becomes public. 
And then the way to enforce an award in a national court is uh, to file it there. So it becomes a decree of the court, it's public. So confidentiality is not one of the strongest points, selling points for arbitration. The selling point, and I'll say it again, is that it's a bridge across borders. But in some cases, you find conf confidentiality where parties do not talk about it and uh, they have an award. But rarely do you see that happening. When one party has an award, they rush to court to enforce it. So yes, it is uh, in an ideal situation, confidentiality is there, but in the practical situation, that is not the selling uh, point for arbitration at all. In fact, some of us who practice uh, ADR will tell you, you look at the client and please give the remedy that is appropriate for that day, knowing that some mechanisms are non-coercive, non-binding, and others are binding. If that client is looking for an injunction, that is what you go for. And the Arbitration Act also allows you to seek an injunction before the matter proceeds for arbitration. So there we are. Um, the confidentiality bit is touted as a strong point. And in institutional arbitration, like the Nairobi Center and others, they will not publish your award to the public unless the parties have agreed. And that is, uh, that is true across the board. So, so to that extent, there's confidentiality, uh, but that's not the strongest selling point for arbitration. As to whether it's a scam, I don't want to use the word scam, but uh, I've explained. Indeed. Thank you, Doctor. Um, there's another question here from Brenda. Can parties have both a mediation clause and arbitration clause in their contracts? It's addressed to? You can take it. Yes, they do. You see, uh, what we usually do is have a conflict management clause in a contract. And you find that in the standard form contracts where they encourage settlement in good faith, uh, in the first instance, some form of mediation, now negotiation in good faith. And then if that fails, then it escalates to the more formal mechanisms, ending up with uh, either adjudication in construction industry or arbitration. So it is it has several tires. We start with negotiation, if we can't get there, we go to a mediation. If we can't get there, we go to an adjudication. In a lot of construction disputes, you start with an adjudication, which is uh, done by somebody on the site right there. And if that fails or one party is unhappy about it, the matter goes into arbitration. So it's quite common to find all the mechanisms listed down in a conflict management clause. Thank you, Doctor. Um, the person who asked uh, how many cases has the ESCJ arbitrated, uh, how worship has responded, three matters, and mediated on, on matter. So I gather that uh, the network in Arusha is terrible today. That's why I think a number of you could not uh, hear how worship speak. Apologies, and we shall share her presentation. So I'll move on to the next question because I see there are quite a number. Um, Alexis is asking, how does the East African community member state assist in the execution of an East African Court of Justice award against fellow state member defiant? Any practical example? The question is addressed to her worship. Um, I think her network is poor, but she'll respond in the chat. And then, um, okay. Uh, her worship had responded that uh, the ESCJ has arbitrated on three matters. Someone here is asking in which time frame. So she will respond again in the chat. Okay. Uh, okay. This question is to you, doctor. If implementation of cross border legal practice in East African community has been challenging, I hope that's the word you are going for, how close are we to reality? to realization of arbitration in the East African Court of Justice to the community at large? What I do know is that there are advanced negotiations at various levels to open up the borders for professionals, for traders, and everybody else. And that is happening. What I do know for a fact in the area of arbitration, and uh, Mariori spoke about uh, this as a business, it's already open. You can practice your law in all the five countries 
In fact, globally, you can practice your arbitration anywhere in the world, and it has never been closed, even for a day, because the countries are members, uh, are signatories to the New York Convention, and they have adopted the model law. So we are there cross border. I, I practice cross border myself, and I've never had a problem. But there are negotiations, trade negotiations, to allow full opening of uh, borders across regions. And the blocks are leading those discussions within the East African community. That conversation is ongoing now, and I hope it can reach fruition, starting with the ADR itself and uh, arbitration and AD other forms of ADR right now. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much, Doctor. So oh, there was a question of uh, the matters that have been arbitrated uh, upon by the ESCJ um, of the period. So that's since the establishment of the court. Eh? Yeah, three matters have been arbitrated upon. So we call upon members eh, to make use of uh, the arbitration mandate at the East African Court of Justice. Then um, we have another question. I think it's the last question. In commercial disputes, is it possible to use arbitration facilities after litigation procedures? After, lit after litigation procedures do not work at home, court or when one party is not satisfied? This is to you, doctor. I don't know if you got the question. Can I repeat? Mm, no, it's putting the cart before the horse. If you have, if you're in litigation, you are in a court already. But to answer that question, you can actually say uh, we are going for arbitration. For example, if there's an arbitration clause within the Kenyan context, Section 6 of the Arbitration Act requires the court to stay the matter and send you to arbitration. And that is also found in the model law. So it's quite common to have a matter starting in court, then it goes for arbitration, but finally it ends up back again in court when one party is trying to enforce the award. And I did say controversially that um, arbitration is a court process to a certain extent. So the two are linked that way. So you can start in court, and then if there's a stay, the arbitration goes on, and then you come back to enforce the, the award. And there are also um, limited appeals and setting aside. So it is possible to have a matter present in court but also uh, going on through tribunal. Secondly, the court has very many functions in aiding arbitration to move forward. If you look at the Arbitration Act, uh, Kenya Arbitration and Conciliation Act, Uganda, you find those provisions. You see, you see the role of the court in arbitration is quite key and major. And it's a subject for another day we can discuss. Sure. Uh, okay, <laughs> we have another question. Uh, what is the practicability of ADR methodology in criminal matters, especially in murder cases, bearing in mind the forms of punishment awarded are, are to enhance deterrence in criminal acts at the very least? The last time I had this discussion, it took about half a day, okay, because there were emotional, a lot of emotional outputs. But uh, what I would uh, plead with everyone is to Whenever you say ADR, break it down. What are we talking about? Are we not talking about negotiation? Can there be something like plea bargaining? For example, in the EAC, um, um, EACC, for example, if you are accused of having stolen some public land, if you return the title, wouldn't you plea bargain? The national, in Kenya, in Kenya, you have the National Cohesion and Integration Act recognizes reconciliation. So you have hate speech, which is a felony, but the act itself says you can reconcile. Within the traditional dispute resolution mechanisms across the years in Africa, we do not have, have that dichotomy of criminal and civil. It's just a recent one. And there are a lot of criminal matters that can actually be resolved through a ADR. For example, if you quarrel and insult each other and even fight, assault itself, you can agree. So it is not that dichotomy it doesn't really, really, really exist. There are some serious offenses, offenses against uh, children or other offenses uh, like murder, qua murder, just murder itself. But in a lot of jurisdictions, the so-called ADR and the formal systems go together. 
there, there is even a victim offender ADR mediation so that the victim is talking with the people he has wronged or she has wronged, but that doesn't reduce the sentence. If it's a death sentence, it's, it remains. That you find in Canada and other places. So the two are not mutually exclusive. And what is a bit trouble or uh, can go to ADR in one country is a matter of public policy. So a lot will depend on how we shape our public policy. Uh, and then we must realize, look, for hundreds of years, there were no prisons uh, across Africa. How did people live? There must have been a way they were doing things. And what can we borrow from there? But yes, the debate is there, and it's a hot debate. I don't want to get into it today. It may take the next eight hours we don't have. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. We have another question for you here. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Karyuki, for the further explanations on ADR. Is it, is it really alternative in our culture? Sorry, is it really alternative in our culture? On my side, whatever it may be called, I go out. I'm sorry, and we need you to to write your question again. I feel to read it. Um, that is liberal. I, I, I can try and answer that half of okay. that question. Okay. In Africa, ADR is not alternative at all. And the sooner we realize that, the better. Because who? how do we live? For example, courts, they close on Friday. They open on Monday. How do we live over the weekend? It's a question of that harmony that I was talking about. And uh, you will realize some of the ADR mechanisms do not even need training. The mothers, your fathers, sisters, uncles, they are always negotiating something within the villages. So it's in Africa, it is not alternative. It's the mainstream. In Europe and other places, it's the alternative because the mainstream is the court. So we need to uh, discuss that and agree that across here, if it's not alternative, then what is it? What is it called in various places? And then we identify it and take the best from it and leave out the worst of it because I don't um, really glorify everything within it. But it's something very common. Who cannot negotiate? How many, for example, mediators do we have here? If it's 300, we have 300 because you've uh, nego if uh, mediation is an extension of uh, negotiation, you've negotiated at home. Do you need to be neutral? It's an, again, it's a discussion for another day because we are asking the question, what does a mediator bring to the table? Your own mothers, fathers, uncles are all mediators. So this very uh, interesting knowledge, how do we mainstream it, capture it, and also find out who is doing it? uh something called um stakeholder analysis who are these people who are doing these things and can we then include them instead of excluding them through formality yeah. thank you doctor the this question is also addressed to you thank you dr karaoke for that my question is what is your position in having adr implemented in criminal cases <laughs> especially the ones that involve murder cases, ADR court justice. I have, I have already answered answered that. answered. Yeah, that's true. That, and I have given you some law to look at where yes. ADR is already inside there. If we mm. agree conciliation is part of it, mm. then look at the National Cohesion and Integration Act. Mm, true. Mm. So there's another question here from Dr. Kalu. What is the relevance, if any, to our discussion here of the China International Commercial Court? established 2018 to adjudicate on all commercial disputes arising out of Belt and Road Initiative projects with its seat in Beijing, language Chinese, members Chinese, but with an advisory panel of international jurists. There have been discussions about whether it is indeed prudent to have a, a court, an international court that is a court and not a mediation panel that renders judgments. And uh, I think they, we should look at uh, some convention called the Judgment Convention, which uh, is right there. And international judgments then will be treated the same way as international awards. And that discussion is there. And it's not just a discussion. Practically, we have some commercial courts that are, are as efficient as arbitral tribunals. And the question that is being asked is this, why? would you subject yourself to arbitration when you have a commercial court 
that is efficient. Uh, I will not uh, comment on the Chinese one. I do not know much about it, but I do know there are commercial courts, several of them, uh, and they operate as courts. And there is a convention and nations are signing up to the judgment convention. Question is, we let overtake the New York convention in terms of acceptability so that you go to an international court rather than an international tribunal. So it's something that is evolving and it's evolving quite fast. Language is not a problem in any country because we have software that translates for you uh, everywhere. We can, language is actually not a problem. We are able to practice law in any part of the world. And whatever language you speak is translated for you automatically. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, okay, we have a question here from Mugume Ellen. How do we litigants? How do we get litigants to trust the ADR process? And she's another question. Our East African governments are slow to respond to ADR and do most cases it's donor initiatives and this limits our ability to invest in doing so. Again, you can see the problem. That person is already calling it alternative. If you go and uh, negotiate uh, a multi-million dollar claim and you get paid your fees, haven't you done your job? If you go to an arbitration, if you can uh, classify arbitration as ADR, some people think it's not ADR. Again, haven't you gotten an award that is enforceable across all the countries? And you don't have to trust your award, just enforce it. We also have uh, other uh, institutions like ICSID. If you have an ICSID award, it's enforceable against uh, any state anywhere without a national court. So mechanisms, and I do, I will say this again, choose the mechanism that works for your client. If your client's house is about to be demolished and there's a bulldozer outside, you probably need police first and then an injunction because mediation can take years. So these are mechanisms or tools in a toolbox that you can choose for yourself. I'm a litigator personally. And if a client comes to me and he wants litigation, we are in court that afternoon. However, I practice ADR because I do know it works. With the Singapore Convention on uh, Mediation, commercial disputes are going into mediation and it's enforceable as a judgment, like a, just like a judgment across jurisdictions, the Singapore Convention. So that is trustworthy if you're looking for some formality there because uh, it's not always informal. It, is, it can get as formal as possible and countries will accept that. So if you, if you are seeking to go into international practice, you must uh, do ADR to a certain extent. International courts and tribunals, a lot of them are just uh, arbitral tribunals, nothing else. So it does pay to know something about what is arbitration internationally. And then even um, those courts also have provision for conciliation and mediation. I'm thinking about the International Tribunal, the Law of the Sea, and others, in International Court of Justice, and many others. So it is important to know everything you need to know if you are to branch out to the whole world. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. We have another question. Uh, what is your opinion on appealability, appealability of arbitral Oh, okay, appealability of arbitrary awards in light of the new two cases at uh, the Supreme Court of Kenya. Is the jurisprudence sound and progressive or does it hinder the principle of finality? That question is from uh, Kesumwa. The good thing about it is that uh, I have an answer which has, it will take about 30 pages. There is a book of mine called uh, Settling Disputes Through Arbitration in Kenya, fourth edition. And I wrote the fourth edition principally to address that question. That book is available online for free. Please access it and then um, reach out to me later after reading the 30 pages that covers that discussion. It's available for free between Kenya, Uganda, anywhere in the world. And I wrote the fourth edition mainly to cover that. Is that good enough? Then we can have a discussion because it's a long discussion involving many other cases in between, between Newton, and another one. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Uh, this question was to our worship, but uh, she'll respond in the chat. 
uh, the opportunities in the East African Court of Justice, other internship programs for students interested in arbitration in the East African region. Yeah, so thank you so much. Someone was tuning in from South Sudan. Thank you. And looking forward to other engagements like this. Um, thank you so much. I think that was our last question. Uh, okay, doctor, someone is asking what's the title of the book? Settling Disputes Through Arbitration in Kenya. If you can't remember the title, just Google my name. It will give you all my publications. They are online and free. I don't sell. Mm, thank mm. you. Thank you, doctor. So I will do now, we'll now have parting shots from each of you, our speakers today. I think we can start with you, doctor. For me, um, ADR is really not alternative. We need to interrogate that question and ask uh, whether it is appropriate dispute resolution. We must define it in African terms. We must Africanize uh, conflict management, also respect our systems here. There is hope, but we need to look at it very, very objectively and see whether we can borrow from uh, the best from uh, the formal systems, the, the best from the informal moving forward so that we have a, a framework that supports uh, effective conflict management within the African context. And we need to have a philosophy, an African philosophy of conflict management. South Africa is ahead. They have done it. Can we do it? We can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, Mr. Muiruri, you can give us your parting shots. Um, thank you very much, Edith. Uh, it was a privilege for me to be in the panel with Daktari, uh, with David, Amina, and our worship. Always a delight to engage on this very interesting subject. For me, I think, as I said at the beginning, <clears throat> Ours is to enlarge uh, the space, uh, bake a bigger cake for all of us. I believe there is enough that will sustain our practices across the region. And uh, together we can access business even beyond the region. Why we have come into partnership uh, is so that we can uh, provide that platform for us to discuss ways and means by which we can um, repatriate the exodus of disputes from the continent, from the region, allow for them at least to have the choice whether to export or to handle our disputes here. Uh, the issue is not being resolved by um, East Africans or Africans, but is to have a choice uh, and to ensure that our jurisdictions have the necessary framework infrastructure that allows you, the practitioner, to advise your clients confidently that their disputes can be uh, handled with the frameworks provided for uh, within the region, one of which is an Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. Uh, for you also to be uh, visible, uh, to gain the necessary exposure, experience, and eventually uh, to be an authority of excellence, as we have uh, in, the, in the person of the Daktari, uh, to be able to handle a dispute uh, no matter the source and no matter the uh, the parties um, and to create that access um, for 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 you and beyond the region. Uh, with that, we hope we have created enough interest for you uh, to continue to interact with the center, with the society in this um, arena of appropriate dispute resolution as Dr. Tari has perhaps uh, nudged us to look at it. And we then invite you to consider uh, participating with us in the Nairobi Arbitration Week between 18th to 22nd September this year. We welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mary, for your parting shots. Um, Ms. Amina, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I think, uh, thank you very much. I think everything that uh, needs to be said uh, have been shared by the other panelists. I still believe, I also believe that uh, we as legal practitioners, there's a lot of opportunities for us in the ADR sector within the East African community and the East Africa as, as a whole. 
I mean, considering there's a tripartite agreement with Kumesa, SADC, and EAC, so the ADR is still expanding uh, all over Africa. And the UN Charter still uh, leaves room uh, for, leaves space for mediation and uh, the use of arbitration in, in solving disputes and whatnot. So we, there is a need for us to educate ourselves and to be more open minded with ADR. Uh, thank you very much. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Amina. So um, last but not least, we shall have Mr. Segano for parting shots and closing remarks. Thank you all for attending this webinar. Over to you, Mr. Segano. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Edith. I, I was waiting for you to ask uh, more of us to join the, the Women Arbitration Initiative that you created, uh, but I believe we're going to, to do that. Um, now, before I, I speak, and thank our great panel of uh, speakers. Let me address the, a question that was addressed on uh, internships. Uh, though the deputy registrar, her worship was, was not on the call by the time that was addressed, we have a few internship opportunities that, that we offer as East Africa Law Society. And uh, we do secondment of the interns to the African court. And in a few instances, uh, to the East African Court of Justice. So in case you're interested, you can get, uh, you can reach us and uh, we, we will find a way to, to, to place you at least in, uh, in those two institutions. And I would also like to recognize the presence of uh, the former registrar of the East African Court of Justice, uh, Mr. Yufnali Sokubo. Thank you for being on the call, sir. Uh, we, we appreciate you. You are one of the people that uh, really helped uh, grow the arbitration mandate of the East African Court of Justice uh, up to where it is now. Um, to my closing remarks, uh, thank you, Dr. Mwigwa. Thank you, uh, Ms. Tangugi. Thank you, Amina. Thank you, Edith. And of course, her worship for facilitating this session. Uh, I believe uh, those of us who are on the call have learned a thing or two. I have personally learned. I believe every day is a day to learn. And uh, other than use ADR, probably now we should consider all, uh, appropriate as uh, uh, advised by Dr. Mwigwa. Uh, besides that, uh, I would like to thank the center, the Nairobi Center, for giving us uh, two important chances. The first one is uh, the fact that the center will uh, give the East Africa Law Society members an opportunity to get concessionary rates uh, when you use the center's facilities. Uh, and so that is a big uh, thing for those who would like to utilize the facilities at the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. And also the fact that they are now allowing most of our members to access the panel uh, at the center. So Lawrence and you, your team, our team will reach out to you so that uh, we can get that criteria. And then we'll be able to share that out to our members so that uh, many of our experts that uh, are unable to access the center can then access it and uh, utilize it to uh, help their, uh, their clients. Uh, the other thing is with regard to the book, uh, Dr. Mwigwa, thank you for having free publications. And uh, this shows uh, why you keep being selected as the best uh adr practitioner potentially in the continent not just the region uh we will download some of your documents or some of your publications and then we will share with the members that have attended this particular training so my team is going to download them and compile them alongside the presentations made today and share them with the uh the delegates on this platform so no need for you to go online and search we will do that for you um another update on our training we have a fidi contracts training in august for for those that uh, are interested and one of the training aspects of uh, the fidi contracts training will be uh, resolving construction disputes using alternative means mostly arbitration so if you are interested then you should be on the lookout you're going to release publicity materials on that you can register it it's going to take place between 8th and 12th of august uh, 2023, potentially in Kenya. Uh, we have other training sessions coming up. Uh, these are physical training events. If you're interested, 
We have legal and legislative drafting in Arusha coming up the end of uh, June. Uh, we have in-house council convention coming up in July in Zanzibar. And uh, we have a regional integration conference uh, coming up in September. So regional integration conference is a new conference that uh, we are piloting to essentially look at where we are in terms of integration, all aspects of integration, not just ADR. Um, in addition to that, if you've attended this session, you will receive a certificate. We are working with Diwala. So if you get an email from us or Diwala, it will have your certificate of attending this particular session. Please download. They might want you to register. So if it prompts you to register, please uh, register and you'll be able to download uh, your certificate of attendance of this particular uh, session. That said, uh, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to everyone who took their time to attend this particular uh, training. We are going to offer much more uh, in partnership with the center, Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. Uh, and of course, I welcome you uh, to the arbitration week again. It's, it's, it's a first in the region. And so it will be very interesting to see many of us uh, attend uh, that week in Nairobi. That said, thank you very much. I wish you a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you to Have all. Good, good evening. evening. Good evening. Bye bye.